Welcome also to our side session on uh, surveillance. My name is uh, Dirk Meusel. I'm working for the uh, European Commission, DG Sante, in the unit B2 on health security. Um, I cannot say good morning. I cannot say good afternoon. It's somewhat in between. So I'm saying thank you that you are sparing your lunch break and, and uh, joining us for this um, side session. Um, the topic is about new initiatives on integrated surveillance under the European Health Union and the SCBTH regulation. Now it calls for explaining to you what the acronym means. Uh, it is a serious cross-border uh, threats to health regulation, which is very new, and, and I will explain it in my presentation uh, later on. Um, now, what is the objective of our session here, of our side session? It's not a scientific session, which we have in the, in the conference, but you know the SCIT conference is the European Scientific Conference on Applied Infectious Disease Epidemiology. So what we would like to do is in this side session to showcase where all the science which you are presenting during the conference is going into it um, in, in a very practical sense. What are we doing at national and European level? in terms of infectious disease surveillance using the scientific evidence which uh, you're producing. Now, as part of the European Health Union package, you remember it was in, in the year 2020 that the Commission was presenting this um, proposal for European Health Union package. Um, we had this new leg legislation um, on the serious cross-border health threats uh, to health. Um, which was finally entering in, into, um, into uh, legislation on the 26th of December 22. And therein we have uh, three, uh, the, the chapter three, which is mainly outlining all the new uh, initiatives, all the new, um, new uh, circumstances for epidemiological surveillance, the digital platform for surveillance and, and reference laboratories. And this is what we would like to, to present to you in this side session. Um, we will have three presentations um, in, in this side session. One uh, will be done by myself. I will ex explain to you what we have um, in the current um, regulation and for surveillance and uh, where we are with the current state of implementation. We will have one presentation on um, fit for purpose surveillance in Europe and the EZDC long term surveillance strategy and framework, which will be uh, uh, introduced by our colleagues of this, uh, EZDC. And we will have a presentation uh, from the joint action of, uh, on the United for Surveillance, uh, which is currently, um, which started in the beginning of the year and which has currently the first results available. Um, furthermore, we would also like to give you some uh, information about uh, current funding uh, mechanisms which we have put in place to improve surveillance systems following the lessons learned of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, straight away, we have one hour. Straight away, I would uh, like to go into the presentation. I will go over. And may I ask for the first slides? Now, my presentation will be focusing on integrated surveillance under the EU uh, Health Union and the SCPHT regulation. So this shall be, give you a, a short introduction into what is available in the uh, legislative framework, which we have. There are four major points. I would like to, to reflect with you a bit on what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, told us or which lessons we learned from it. Then, uh, shortly outlining the uh, European Health Union package, uh, the um, epidemiological surveillance, which is, which is within this package um, and this, within this regulation, and um, also some points on the implementation. Now, if you're looking at the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, what has happened in terms of uh, surveillance, uh, we remember we had the acute phase um, in the years 2020, 2021, and what is listed here on the slides is basically the, the uh, European Commission communications on the topic which were published in the respective years, which you see here. Um, I'm not going into detail of all of those, but um, what is clear is that in the beginning of the pandemic, we were very much looking at how the pandemic is behaving. So we wanted to have, in the terms of surveillance, as much as possible information on the cases being uh, nearly complete, hopefully complete, to see what is happening. 
Now, during the years, specifically with the onset of the Omicron in the beginning of 22, uh, this was all changing, and the first calls uh, were also saying that uh, COVID would remain with us, but um, we would need a surveillance system which is more sustainable, which uh, we can sustain with the available resources which we will have after the pandemic. And this is where we called for also a representative uh, surveillance system, integrated surveil integrating different sources of surveillance and integrating different diseases. Um, this all became more momentum also when um, WHO was um, basically um, uh, raising the issue of the uh, lowering the, the uh, public health emergency of international concern studies of COVID and also in uh, their communication here clearly uh, calling for an integrated surveillance, um, sustainable in the, um, and representative uh, surveillance systems. Now, this is a bit of the frame where we are with, with the current legislation. Would also like to give you um, one of the, the publications of the ECDC, which is the lessons from, from the COVID-19 pandemic, where we do have four major lessons areas. And I would draw the uh, attention to you on the last one, collection and analysis of data and evidence, which clearly outlines that during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where we clearly uh, saw an increase in surveillance activities, and we, we could see that um, um, digital systems were enabling us quite much. You remember the uh, COVID-19 dashboards were increasing like mushrooms um, uh, everywhere. So there was really a um, an increase in, in surveillance activities, but now the, the um, real lesson learned is to how to integrate it with other uh, surveillance systems, with other diseases, with other data sources to make it sustainable in the long run. Coming to the uh, European Health Union legislative package, uh, we have four major regulations which are in this package, which um, all um, were basically adopted in the end of last year, in 22 which is the uh, serious cross-border health threats to health uh, regulation, um, but also which is the extended mandate of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and which is also the um, extended mandate of the European Medicines Agency, and which is the Council regulation on medical countermeasures for the supply of medical countermeasures in uh, cases of pandemics. So what we see um, here is um, in, in this slide that we really see the, the, the cross-border health threats regulation as a, um, as a major umbrella regulation, which is touching all the others as well. So uh, one should not look at the extended mandate of the ECDC without looking at the serious cross-border health threats regulation and vice versa. Likewise, for the revised EMA mandate and also for all the um, 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 provisions for, for the medical countermeasures, mainly also the Commission decision on the setting up of the uh, HERA and um, the in vitro diagnostic medical devices uh, reference laboratories. Um, when it comes to epidemiological surveillance within the regulation, uh, we have um, as the major aspects the Article 13, which is uh, outlining the network of epidemiological surveillance, um, but which is also defining that in, in the next years, the um, Commission together with the Member States needs to define the list which are under uh, the list of notified communicable diseases which are under uh, uh, um, surveillance and also their case definitions. What we also have is Article 14, which is defining the digital platform for surveillance. This is the platform where all the member states need to report to uh, on, this, um, uh, on this list of notifiable diseases, for which we also have to make an implementing act uh, for, for the functioning of, uh, of the, um, the platform and uh, which data will be shared here but we will see more of, of, um, this, uh, of, the, of this part of the regulation in the presentation of the ECDC. Now, what we also have is Article 15, which is uh, outlining the European reference laboratories, which we are currently in the process of nominating those laboratories for human pathogens uh, surveillance. Um, and then also the Article 16, which has the network of uh, human substances of human, uh, a network of substances of human origin, which is now also being hosted under the umbrella of the ECDC. Um, I will skip 
those. So what you have seen basically is here a list of very much directly defined aspects of surveillance in the regulation, but also you have links of surveillance activities in all the other aspects of the regulation. Might it be the public health emergency at union level, which is a new aspect of the regulation? We, uh, might it be the risk assessment and joint procurements, which are also defined in the regulation? The Health Security Committee is relying on, on the surveillance activities and uh, has also a quite much extended mandate in the regulation. The early warning response system um, and also the preparedness reporting is all linked to surveillance activities. And uh, one of the major new parts of the, of the regulation is the national and union uh, preparedness and response plans, uh, which also heavily rely on surveillance activities. So you see that uh, surveillance um, within the regulation is quite a central uh, point. For the implementation, uh, what we have currently is um, um, at the, the, the union level is basically the, uh, the funding via the EU for Health program. You, you are aware that the, the funding has increased quite much uh, compared to the previous um, programs. We have um, the United for Surveillance uh, Joint Action, which is a consortium out of member state competent authorities, which we will have in the second half of, of our side session here. We have uh, direct grants, which we are currently negotiating with, uh, with member states. We have uh, funding for, for the extension of the early warning and response system for the EU reference laboratories, for a joint action on AMR, which also has activities on surveillance, and um, for analysis and lessons learned out of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of, of uh, EU health and also the uh, uh, COVID uh, response pandemic. Uh, the last and most important slide here I would give also in, in relation to the presentation on the joint action for United for Surveillance is that we basically see everything as a, as a network of activities and not standalone uh, activities. So we have the joint action, which is uh, a project with, uh, with, with member states, uh, which shall work in close cooperation together with the EZDC uh, team on surveillance which should also inform uh, directly the, um, the Health Security Committee for risk management. But also we are now, uh, as I said, negotiating grants for uh, direct grants for, for member states where we would like to give also some funding to member states for closing their gaps in the surveillance. And here it's important to notify that some countries might have smaller gaps, some countries might have larger gaps. Therefore, we would like to make single grants, but we do see it all as a one network of uh, activities. Now, coming to my conclusion is that we have, um, following the COVID-19 pandemic, we have um, a high political attention on surveillance uh, currently, um, so which we can use for ensuring integrated and sustainable approaches to surveillance. We have a legal base which is very strong on surveillance, and we also have a significant funding available for improving our surveillance systems. And I think this is uh, all three points taken together, quite an, 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 a good situation for thinking about how we get better our surveillance systems. And with this, I would like to give uh, the floor to um, uh, Carlos, Carlos uh, Carvalho, uh, which is working with the um, EZDC uh, team on, on surveillance. He's a medical doctor uh, specialized in, in field epidemiology and will speak about approaches of integrated surveillance uh, and the uh, EZDC surveillance framework. Thanks, Dirk. Um, I'll stick to good morning. I guess no one had lunch yet, so good morning. Uh, I will talk a bit about the strategies for fit for purpose surveillance and uh, our ECDC long term surveillance framework and our vision for surveillance in the next years. As you know, and Dick mentioned already, uh, Dirk mentioned already, this is uh, framed by two very important pieces of legislation that were published uh, late last year the serious cross border threats to health regulation that I will refer to as SCBDH just because it's easier to pronounce, and the amendment to the CDC founding regulation or our extended mandate. Um, 
It's clear from our uh, new uh, uh, mandate or the, the amendment to the funding regulation that there's a much stronger uh, role for ECDC to support the EU member states in the prevention and control of communicable disease threats uh, and to improve preparedness of uh, Europe or European Union for future health challenges. And there's a reinforced mandate focusing on digitalization and integration of surveillance systems. These are two terms that I will use a lot during this presentation. Uh, are bu buzzwords uh, nowadays, and I will try, I'll do my, be my best to, to explain what we understand uh, by these terms. So all this is aligned in the uh, ECDC long-term surveillance framework 2021-2027. And our vision there is that uh, we have uh, strong harmonized national surveillance systems that lead to a harmonized EU uh, surveillance system, that we make the best use of different data sources, uh, that we explore new data sources or uh, um, make use, have access and can use the, some alternative data sources that we make use of the best technology that is available or being developed in the current stage of digitalization, that we have a continuous, automated, integrated and timely digital uh, use of digital data streams. Again, four very important terms that I will use a lot and with, with uh, different meanings sometimes. Uh, that we are able to provide the right information to those who need that information and also support the member states in doing so and do that at the right time, right place, with the right kind of information and data. And then finally, that we address cross-border threats to public health from communicable diseases in a timely and efficient manner, uh, meaning that with less resources, we achieve the most goals. Now moving to priorities, uh, I, I would like to highlight four surveillance objectives uh, and they are related to have uh, timely threat detection and monitoring uh, in a continuous way. So we have threat assessments uh, uh, ongoing that we are able to monitor disease burden and risk. And finally, that we are able to assess effectiveness and impact of interventions. Uh, these four are quite, quite important. There are others. But uh, around these four, I think we can build and uh, work out our strategy. Then in terms of operational goals, um, we would like to keep the reporting burden for member states manageable, uh, meaning as, uh, um, less, at less effort from member states, we would get uh, more information but then also gather no more data than is needed, uh, but then the data that is needed, we manage to collect it in a timely way and in an efficient way too. Then we would also like to increase resilience of surveillance systems. Resilience was another buzzword during the pandemic from healthcare professionals to uh, surveillance systems. So definitely we want to make sure that the surveillance systems are ready to withstand another pandemic or a situation um, like the COVID-19 pandemic. And then that we are able to address data protection concerns that have been voiced by most countries uh, across Europe. So moving to our work plan, it starts also, Dirk also mentioned the, the update of the list of diseases and uh, special health issues under EU surveillance that will come hopefully via an implementing act in 2024. This is not only the list, but also the case definitions for the diseases. And then moving forward that we uh, develop and, and share uh, objective driven surveillance standards that include clear uh, disease specific surveillance objectives and uh, that we that allow us to monitor and improve surveillance processes. We have the, also the, um, regarding digitalization, the e-health, uh, ECDC e-health program that includes different initiatives that we hope will support improving surveillance uh, across the European Union. Uh, the, we have the surveillance from electronic health data project. Uh, we are currently working on or will work in, on three different diseases or groups of diseases. We started last year with the severe acute respiratory infections and bloodstream infections. And next year, we will start working with the member states on the use of electronic health records also for sexually transmitted infections. So this is a quite important project for us that we have been uh, allocating a lot of resources to. 
uh, but then we have the European Health Data Space uh, uh, Secondary Use of Health Data, the HDS2 pilot. We have been working with an external consortium also testing uh, this HDS space for uh, antimicrobial resistance surveillance. Uh, and first results will will uh, we will have the first results in the coming months of this, and then also and very importantly participate in and support other EU initiatives like the joint action on integrated surveillance, but also the direct grants that Dirk mentioned and uh, other like the Darwin project or uh, uh, EHDS one. So all these we will try to be involved and try to ensure that uh, the results uh, support our role in, in developing surveillance across EU. Then there are other topics that are also important. So we will keep developing the, our digital platform for surveillance, EpiPulse, that uh, where uh, TESI is nested, as you know, uh, that work on the automation of epidemic intelligence, making the best use of art artificial intelligence for uh, epidemic intelligence, but also for other purposes, such as extracting health data for surveillance purposes from unstructured records and others. Uh, so AI will definitely be a, a, an area that we will keep an eye on uh, to support the development of surveillance. And then also to keep the whole genome sequencing rollout and support timely detection, investigation and monitoring of, of multinational outbreaks. We want to, and this is also part of the extended mandate, to work a lot on capacity building, not only internally um, at ECDC. We will try to ensure that uh, all the staff has, have uh, enough uh, uh, training on data management and science, and we have um, epidemic intelligence uh, skills developed for, for the um, developing surveillance systems but also to support the member states in developing their own capacity, either through grants or other initiatives uh, like uh, ECDC trainings on projects, uh, the URLs for public health, etc. Then we also want to involve other countries, not only the EUEA, the EU enlargement countries, the neighborhood countries and the African countries through different initiatives. Um, so we hope by using those initiatives, we can also support capacity building. Then on integrated surveillance, I wanted to highlight this because there's, there's, uh, um, this term has been used with uh, many different meanings. Uh, there's integration between different diseases that sh share certain characteristics, like for instance, respiratory viral infections, uh, surveillance of uh, um, RSV, influenza and COVID-19, because they share many common attributes can be integrated. But then we have integration of different surveillance systems like indicator-based, event-based, molecular or wastewater. Uh, also between different data sources, and we have been investing a, a lot on this, that requires uh, some degree of data linkage. Now we're thinking about case-based data. We would like to ensure that we manage to collect and link epidemiological data with the laboratory data, electronic health record data, immunization registries, and this at all levels from the local uh, to the regional, to the national, and then to the European level. But also we have integration between administrative levels and across sectors. All these are areas where we have to work on integration. And there's one that is not on the list and it's actually quite important, which is the integration of surveillance in the existing uh, health information systems. So we, need, we definitely need to work on making sure that uh, some data that is relevant for public health is available in the health information systems and not only the data that is relevant or are relevant for the management of patients. I'm thinking of primary care, hospital, hospitals, but all levels of um, health care. Uh, there should be some uh, time dedicated to ensure that uh, information that is are relevant for surveillance is c collected or at least there's, there's a space where we can access that data. Now to close, I will just quickly present the results of a survey that we shared in May uh, this year that was, uh, was discussed during the National Focal Points for Surveillance annual meeting in, in Stockholm in May. 
And uh, here you s can see uh, probably some of the letters are, are quite small, but the green ones are the, the ones that I wanted to highlight. And they are all about, so this is the opinion of the member states, it's not ECDC, uh, uh, ECDC's opinion, although we agree. And uh, the main areas of investment would be full digitalization of surveillance process and automation of reporting and integration of different data sources. So here you see that uh, the needs seem to be aligned between countries, uh, ECDC, uh, and the European level. To work on this uh, digitalization, uh, there are multiple challenges that we have to address and we are starting to do it now. Uh, there's the need to allow data access and data sharing uh, in compliance with GDPR. This is something that we have been hearing uh, every time we talk about uh, uh, setting up new data streams, collecting additional data from electronic health records, uh, the concerns about GDPR compliance. And I, I think at the national level, you uh, have, you hear the same issues from the regional level and probably the regional level from the local level. So the GDPR issues are uh, a constant and we definitely want to work on this to ensure that uh, we collect enough data to fulfill our public health mission. Then there's uh, another issue with the, uh, the large heterogeneity in terms of digitalization of health records and of surveillance. It's not only about the surveillance process itself that in some countries is not as well developed as in others. It's also of the actual uh, health records that uh, in some circumstances is still are still being recorded in paper and not actually digitalized. So there's a large uh, uh, heterogeneity there that we have to address in order to have a functioning EU level surveillance. Then there's a, uh, we, we observe that sometimes we, there's a lack of clear prioritization of surveillance objectives in the e-health strat strategies at the national level. And when, when these are uh, in the, uh, included in the e-health strategies, they differ from, from country to country. And finally, there's the questions about the health data standards and terminologies. This has been discussed a lot um, and, and uh, we, we still have a work in front of us in order to harmonize, first to explore what is available, then see what works best and then be able to recommend to the member states and to harmonize so we can actually make the best use of uh, electronic health data for surveillance of infectious diseases. And that was it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. And I would straight away uh, go into the next presentation. And I see already there are some questions in the, uh, in the question box, which I would uh, then take in the end of uh, our side session here. I would now um, introduce to you a presentation on the Joint Action United for Surveillance, uh, its main objectives and uh, structure, but also the uh, first preliminary results from uh, a work package on strengthening uh, outbreak detection and um, national capacity building on One Health surveillance. And we have uh, three speakers online. Uh, we have Elko Franz. Elko Franz is from the Center for Infectious Disease Control, the National Institute for Public Health and Environment, the RIVM. And he's the, um, um, the um, head of department epidemiology and surveillance. Uh, he is also the coordinator of the joint action, and I'm very happy that he is here presenting together with colleagues the joint action. Then we have um, with us Gudrun, um, Gudrun Witwen Freidel from, from the um, Department of Data Integration and Analysis of the Statens Serum Institute SSI in, in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark. Very much welcome. She's a senior consultant and also participating in the joint action under uh, the work package, uh, which she will present. And then we also have uh, Paulina from uh, Felde. She's a researcher with the Robert Koch Institute um, and also project coordinator working with the Department of Infectious Disease and Epidemiology and the unit of surveillance at the Robert Koch Institute and also being involved in the joint action work here. So the floor is yours. Um, please uh, present the joint action United for Surveillance. Uh, first is the floor to Elko. Thank you. Okay, Dirk, thank you very much uh, for this kind uh, introduction. Um, 
in the in the second half of this uh, session, we will indeed uh, present uh, the Joint Action United for Surveillance. And as already has been mentioned, uh, United for Surveillance uh, is indeed one of the methods to give body to the uh, implementation of the of the new regulation on, on cross-border health threats, um, where we have a mission to be better prepared for uh, future cross-border health threats. Um, so I skipped the uh, introduction of the people, but because that was already kindly done uh, uh, by Dirk. But uh, I will sh um, introduce you to some of the um, overall objectives uh, of the joint action, and then uh, Gudrun will uh, will talk about some uh, recent results already obtained from uh, improving uh, laboratory-based reporting. Uh, and Paulina will then uh, uh, take over and talk about the uh, work that she has been done on uh, outbreak detection methods. And finally, uh, Rowan will talk about uh, what we are doing in the area of One Health surveillance. So uh, what was already mentioned, of course, uh, uh, by Dirk, that um, um, we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, although in a lot of countries the response was uh, was quite good, that there were also uh, a lot of gaps and that uh, in some instances uh, the response was uh, suboptimal, uh, also due to surveillance systems that were suboptimal. Well, that was uh, also one of the reasons why uh, the Euro European Commission uh, provided uh, the budget for a joint action on um, integrated surveillance. Um, as a response to that, um, we uh, constructed an, uh, a large European-wide consortium, uh, which we named United for Surveillance, uh, which is a joint action um, of, uh, of a lot of uh, competent authorities working together on strengthening um, uh, infectious disease surveillance. Uh, we managed to get together uh, 24 member states um, uh, in this uh, joint action, and uh, uh, overall, these are uh, more than 40 institutes working to, to, uh, together in this consortium. Um, these institutes uh, you see here, uh, and they are split into different roles that the institutes can have uh, within the joint action. Of course, primarily there are the beneficiary institutes, um, which are uh, usually the public health institutes of the, of the different member states, but we also have so-called affiliated entities, which are uh, institutes in the country which um, are, are not uh, per se competent authorities, but uh, play, a, an, play an important role uh, in the surveillance systems of the different member states. And lastly, we also have uh, associated partners, uh, which are partners who are inside the, uh, the consortium more as a listening uh, partner. Um, so the overall objectives of the, uh, of, of the joint action uh, is in the end to develop a roadmap where we describe um, uh, how future um, uh, ideal surveillance systems should look like, but more importantly, what are the gaps and how should we, uh, how should we come there? And the joint action, of course, is not waiting uh, uh, for this roadmap. We are investigating already the gaps and already piloting uh, uh, innovative new surveillance systems uh, leading to this uh, to this roadmap for advice uh, how this on the European level should look like. And it was already mentioned by uh, Carlos, but three main um, uh, subjects uh, overall are the integration of different uh, 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 data sources at the national level. Well, integration, like Carlos said, can be all at, at very much different levels, but also the interoperability between different systems in a country and the digitalization. It's very important to say that at first instance, it is very much um, uh, focused at capacity building at the member state level. But of course, the joint action is there to also link the experiences uh, at member state level together to get also, of course, a much more uh, easy outlook to the future on the European level. And this is uh, just an infographic uh, to show you also where not only yeah, a, a joint action in general, but also the United for Surveillance joint action in specific is a lot about uh, learning, teaching, piloting, so more an iterative way, an iterative way of member states to help each other um, in uh, developing a future surveillance systems. 
One of my last slides before I give the floor to the more content uh, related um, uh, presentations is that besides a lot of work packages that we are working on on coordination and sustainability and communication, we have three core work work packages. One work package dealing with, uh, with improving methods on uh, outbreak detection. There is one work package on um, uh, improving hospital surveillance because it is in a lot of countries also an very much a wish uh, to get more hospital data and to integrate that into uh, routine epidemiological surveillance. And we have a core work package on one health surveillance where we integrate surveillance from the uh, uh, veterinary, environmental and human uh, health sectors. And there will be uh, subsequently two uh, presentations on this um, work package on outbreak detection and on one health surveillance. So with that, I would uh, give the floor to, uh, to Gudrun to present uh, what she has been done within work package two, uh, outbreak detection. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ilko. Um, I'll give you an update of on what we've been doing so far under work package two, outbreak detection. Um, this uh, work package is jointly led by us at State and Serum Institute in Denmark and uh, our colleagues at Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Um, work package two is divided in two task, uh, tasks. Task one is on improving laboratory based reporting that is jointly led by us in Denmark and the RIVM in the Netherlands. And task two is on outbreak and signal detections led by the RKI in Germany. Uh, the aim of task one is to improve uh, real time surveillance for a timely or coordinated response for the reasons that have been outlined by the previous speakers since the SARS CoV 2 epidemic has highlighted major challenges in that area. And for task two, the aim was to increase the capacity of member states to uh, run automated early warning systems. And the objectives, the overall objectives of both of these tasks is to enhance or to, to strengthen the timely and accurate detection of outbreaks that in turn then also um, enhances pandemic preparedness. So for task one, that is further subdivided in six subtasks where um, the first two subtasks uh, multiple countries contribute to and the subtasks three to six are more nationally focused. Those are pilot projects uh, focused on improving national um, reporting of laboratory based surveillance and those are carried out in Denmark, uh, Finland, Norway and the Netherlands based on previously identified uh, gaps in the respective countries. Um, and on subtask one, the needs and gaps analysis with regards to lab based reporting and relational policies. We've had several activities. We had a kickoff workshop that was held here in Denmark in April 2023, where we had selected countries present on their laboratory based reporting systems and um, uh, report on particular challenges. And also to have a more structured approach across um, across countries that are part of the United for, uh, for Surveillance Consortium, we had a survey conducted to assess needs and gaps uh, with respect to lab based reporting. On subtask two, that was focused on data standards uh, and more specifically on the development of a logical data model for genotyping and subtyping. We also held a technical workshop here in Denmark in April 2023, and that resulted in a, in a milestone that is a logical data model report summarizing those findings with uh, input from various countries. Uh, just zoning in for sake of time, just a little bit about the survey we conducted. The aim was to get an overview of countries' laboratory based reporting systems with respect to legal, policy, and organizational, technical, and financial issues, um, to assess the current needs and gaps, and to identify possible areas for action. Um, and the results, I will only focus on one result each per section uh, for sake of time, but they, re they represent results from 23 countries. Um, which are all United for Surveillance Consortium members. So with regards to the legal aspects, we asked countries where, uh, what the extent was they experienced legal constraints or challenges with respect to sharing of laboratory based reporting uh, with sharing laboratory based data um, for notifiable diseases. And we provided a specification um, to make it unmistakable what we mean with constraints or challenges. And we defined it as data cannot be shared or is very difficult to share. And with lab data sharing, we said um, it's about this data that is deemed critical to meet objectives of lab based surveillance. And what you can see here on the graph to the right is that about 40% have reported uh, experiencing challenges to some extent, whereas uh, three countries have experienced uh, 
um, large to very large uh, difficulties. And uh, as Carlos has already mentioned, a theme that has repeatedly come back uh, under the legal aspect section was challenges around uh, GDPR, um, but also uh, issues around national legislations. With regards to policy and organizational aspects, uh, we have asked whether countries have training needs for lab surveillance um, at, at the National Institute for Public Health level that are difficult to meet. And um, again, you can see on the uh, in the graph on the right that um, about a third have reported to have challenges it's to some extent uh, and another third to a very large or to a large extent. So that's uh, very good to hear that there are several initiatives underway um, that can also support the findings of um, this, this survey. Uh, on the technical data and IT aspect section, um, we asked about um, data standards and uh, which international or national data standards are currently used uh, for lab-based surveillance in their countries. And it also relates to what Carlos had said uh, before and, and Ilko as well in terms of interoperability of systems uh, within a country, but also on a supranational level with supranational platforms. And here you can see, although uh, many countries are already ex um, using um, international standards such as LOINC or SNOMED CT or ICD, there's also a significant proportion of other, including national standards that are currently still being used and that could be further explored. Uh, in the financial aspect section, we asked whether the National Institute for Public Health has stable funding sources to maintain laboratory surveillance systems, um, and that didn't include uh, funding of local laboratories. They were targeted in a separate section. Um, and you can see again that about half the countries have uh, reported that they have stable funding to some extent, with three countries struggling to a, to a larger or to a very large extent. Um, all of these results are currently being summarized in a joint work package two deliverable report that, pre that uh, presents a comprehensive overview of the survey results um, and is due to be submitted to the European Commission in December 2023 and upon approval and uh, uh, revision that will be become um, public. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Paulina from RKI who will take you through task two. Yes, thank you, Gudrun. Um, so as Gudrun already mentioned, in task two, we focus on outbreak and signal detection with the overall aim of increasing the capacities of member states running an automated early warning system. So what is actually the motivation behind implementing signal detection automatization? As we know, the early detection of infectious disease outbreaks can help reduce the further spread and reduce harmful consequences, thereby good signals and accurate signals can help contain outbreaks. And this is especially useful in the context of growing availability of data and um, also when human resources are scarce. Um, the work of Task two is carried out in four subtasks um, with multiple active partners involved. Um, we started with a review of outbreak detection activities. This included a survey and a workshop in spring this year. Um, the second step, which we are currently working on, is the benchmarking, so a systematic evaluation of different methods. And of, of course, the tool development for outbreak detection and then next year, the developed tools will be de deployed in piloting systems, followed by an evaluation and providing training material. So we started off um, with a survey on automated outbreak detection tools for routine surveillance data conducted between April to May this year among 21 uh, consortium members. And here we have summarized four key takeaways from the survey. So based on that, uh, 10 countries indicated to plan implementation of tools and the amount of data covered in the described surveillance systems, um, there's definitely a potential for new automated outbreak detection systems. Um, in countries where tools are already used or being developed, those are mostly self-implemented scripts uh, which allow the methods to be easily used by others and transferred to other systems. Um, third, based on the answers to questions on output data, the tool should ideally allow for flexible outputs such as dashboards, lists, tables and reports. Um, and once the tool is implemented, there needs to be a more systematic way of evaluating those signals. Um, as in the survey, it was often stated as the, there's currently a lack of systematic evaluation, um, despite whether the signals are detected, automated or manually. Coming to the tool development, uh, the tool development process has started a few months ago. Um, 
currently five countries are developing tools as an open source software development process on GitHub. Um, our packages are being developed for the outbreak detection, but also for the evaluation of methods. And the approach follows an iterative process with minimum um, viable products, which is then added by further feature each round. And here in the bottom right corner, you can see a screenshot of how the top of the dashboard should look like um, so that users can switch between different tabs of help data. Um, they can adjust the pathogen uh, signals and report tabs. And um, the first tools uh, should be deployed beginning of next year in H2, um, H9 piloting countries. And the majority of uh, the piloting countries will use the tool on data of gastroenteritis and one country will focus um, on respiratory diseases. So here, um, have four figures um, I displayed showing how the output data generated by the tool will probably look like. Um, figure A shows the observed cases in gray bars and the black line uh, there are the expected uh, case numbers and the blue line is the defined threshold and once the observed number of cases go beyond that a signal um, colored here in red it's uh, really small um, is generated. Um, the tool also allows to stretch arrive for certain variables such as age and sex. And in uh, figure B, um, there's a heat map um, where the data uh, is stratified by region and in graph D uh, is stratified by sex. Um, so to wrap up um, and summarize what we want to achieve with um, within the course of the project duration. Um, we want to improve algorithms for automated outbreak detection using infectious disease data. We want to provide a systematic evaluation of different methods. And then we want to deploy the developed tools in the piloting systems to see how they perform on real data and how they are integrated into the daily work. And um, of course, to have a systematic evaluation of these pilots to assess the tool's ability um, to identify outbreaks in a timely and precise manner, and also to assess the user friendliness of the tool, um, which is yeah uh, probably used by epidemiologists. Um, and the overall aim is to provide a freely accessible open source tools and training material. And with this, I will hand over to Rowan. Thank you very much, uh, Paulina. Um, yes, I will be presenting a, a work package for One Health, which is led by uh, the RVM together with uh, Solveig Jorda from uh, Norway. Um, as uh, Ilko already pointed out, is that we're um, the aim of the of work package for us to, well, this is quite a long aim, but it comes down to that we're trying to uh, build on a national level, uh, we're trying to build capacity for uh, One Health surveillance. Uh, by integration of different uh, data from different uh, domains, meaning from the human domain, the environmental domain, and also the, uh, the food and uh, animal domain, uh, with the main aim to, for example, uh, among others, uh, detect outbreaks, but also to, for example, uh, detect emerging pathogens. So within this uh, uh, work package, we have been working throughout uh, three different disease groups. So we have the foodborne uh, disease group, the zoonotic influenza group, and the factorborne infection group. Um, and the, the institutes and the countries listed on top here are the, uh, or uh, just below the task, is the uh, countries that are actually leading the uh, different disease groups. And the idea is that each of the countries participating in United for Surveillance <coughs> Work on uh, one of the work on most of the work on one pathogen and some work on multiple pathogens within each of these disease groups. So uh, each of these disease groups have the same tasks. Um, so they are uh, uh, transversal. With the first task being a stakeholder analysis, which means that we're identifying stakeholders for your uh, One Health surveillance system. So they can be either, for example, for Salmonella or for avian or swine influenza, for example, depending on what the country wants to work on. Um, and the second one is the systems mapping. And the idea is that we map the current surveying system for, let's say, Salmonella or West Nile virus, and we also map the desired surveying system. And we do that then together with the stakeholders that are identified in the first step. And we do that uh, in a workshop, and I'll show you later what it looks like. 
And the third step is, of course, the actual piloting. So actually getting from this current su uh, surveying system to the desired surveying system. And that is something that will start from the beginning of next year. So I'll show you what we've done until now. So this is an example for the analysis. So this is a, a stakeholder analysis that's been finalized by all the countries that were uh, uh, that wanted to do uh, or improve their One Health surveillance system. And this is a Mendelaus matrix where we map each of the stakeholders according to their interest on the x-axis and their influence on the surveillance system on the y-axis. And the goal in this case for Salmonella One Health surveillance, we've mapped the stakeholders uh, with the goal to uh, determine our communication strategies with them, but also to determine who should be part of designing our, the One Health surveillance system in the workshop. So this is just for the analysis, but this is a subset of the stakeholder analysis done by the other countries. So for example, for Belgium, for Salmonella, uh, but also even influenza. So they are involved in multiple disease groups. Then Norway, swine influenza, Spain, West Nile virus, and Austria, in this case for Francisella tularensis. But there are also uh, more stakeholder analysis um, uh, that are uh, of, um, uh, that are yet to be uh, uh, delivered. Uh, but this is the idea that multiple countries have been doing these stakeholder analysis. And then the next step is after we've done the stakeholder analysis to invite this, the relevant stakeholders identified to actually do a systems mapping workshop in person. Um, so this is a picture of uh, Belgium, uh, well, not a picture of Belgium, a picture taken in Belgium, um, where they've come together with these stakeholders for uh, uh, One Health surveillance of Salmonella and also avian influenza. So they sort of did a combined workshop where the idea is that together with these stakeholders, they've determined what does our current surveillance system look like for, in this case, Salmonella and avian influenza. And what we, uh, where do we want to go? So what is our desired system? And then based on that, you can identify the gaps that you need to fill in order to get to your desired system and sort of uh, uh, form action points that you have to do uh, that we're going to actually try to achieve in the coming one and a half years to actually get to the desired system. So one of the potential outputs of uh, 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 such a workshop, uh, workshop is, for example, going back to an example for uh, Salmonella from the Netherlands, is on the left side during the workshop, we've mapped the current surveillance system. I'm not going to go into detail, but the important message here is that this is the current system on the left side, and on the right side, you see the desired system. So based on this, we could identify gaps between the left and the right side. Sorry, this is the wrong button. Um, left and the right side. And uh, during the next one and a half years, we're trying, uh, we're going to go from the left side to the right side. At least that's the idea. So this is done for multiple uh, for multiple countries. That's been that's going to do the uh, pilots in the next few years. Um, then the next steps, like I said, uh, next one and a half years, we're going to try and fill these gaps between the current and desired systems. Uh, and most importantly, because I'm going to be short uh, because I'm running out of time. And Ilko already shortly pointed it out. Is the most important thing is that we're going to do it together with the other countries. So the idea is to do that as a national level, but we get together as frequent as, as we can to also learn from other countries how they actually approach certain challenges. Uh, and India does it provide a sort of a, a, a learning package for other countries. If you want to go to the One Health surveying system, what is the approach that you should take? Um, and lastly, I would like to very much thank you for listening, but also all the institutes and the partners involved in this project uh, uh, with uh, until now very uh, fruitful collaboration. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you. And uh, if you want more information, there's also a website that you could go to. Thanks. Thank you very much for presenting the joint action, all the four of you. Um, very comprehensive, and I think it gives a good picture about uh, what we try to achieve in the whole system of uh, surveillance, integrated surveillance uh, at the EU. Now, looking at the time, we are uh, at 35, so I would take um, two questions uh, which we received through the chat here. As well, the first one. Um, would probably go to EZDC on the surveillance work. Um, could you please provide more information on how to share and contribute or collaborate uh, with EZDC on surveillance work using artificial intelligence? Thanks, Dirk. Yeah, the, the question about artificial intelligence, we, it's a new area of work for surveillance, so we, we're starting to work on this. 
anyone that the, our epidemic intelligence team has uh, worked on a framework contract that will support uh, some initiatives in this field field mainly to the, the starting point will be epidemic intelligence activities but then we hope that we learn some lessons from there and eventually use the same initiative to support also uh, data extraction and interpretation uh, for surveillance purposes too. So for countries that are interested in, in participating, it's just reaching out to us, to our team and uh, surveillance team at the CDC and we will uh, figure it out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one uh, last question to the um, colleagues from the Joint Action, probably the work package on One Health. What are the biggest challenging, uh, challenges uh, with One Health surveillance at national level? Would it be ELCO or Horn. Yeah, thank you very much. That will be me. Um, so yeah, speaking about the national level, and then I mean, let's let let me speak there for the Netherlands. For us, the main challenges are the uh, uh, data sharing uh, with the the issues regarding privacy, and especially it's for us it's easier with the let's say our partner institutes, our par partner governmental institutes. Uh, to share data with each other, but most of the actually the non-human data, because we work in the Public Health Institute, most of the non-human animal and food data actually are with commercial laboratories. And we're now also, because of this United for Surveillance, we're also having conversations with uh, actually those partners to try and uh, see if we can share data with them as well. And those are the main challenges, because for them, it makes sense to uh, uh, sort of protect their customers, while well, we also would like to use their data for public health surveillance. So for us, that's in the Netherlands, at least for Salmonella, the main challenge. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, what we could show to wrap up the, the workshop, what we could show is that um, surveillance systems in, in Europe is a quite complex system. Uh, from from the regional to the um, um, national to the European level at the EZDZ. And um, it is quite a complex uh, network of institutions participating and also different uh, competent authorities in the countries participating to integrate uh, surveillance systems. We wanted to show you what activities are ongoing and uh, of course we also first are interested in your comments and, and, and responses. I thank again the speakers, Carlos, thank you very much for presenting the ECDC, the four colleagues from the Joint Action, uh, thank you very much. And most of all, uh, thank you and the audience very much for sacrificing your lunch for listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.